indeed. Thank you for uh, coming again this week. Uh, so um, let me begin by encouraging you again. Uh, as you've had Pastor Dave today saying that we, some of us went out yesterday uh, into the community. We went on the Baker Street just to do evangelism and to do outreach. It's not an easy thing to go out and, uh, or, or, and knock on people's doors. It's not going to be an easy thing, even as you go into a foreign country like Mozambique, uh, knocking on uh, people's doors or going into people's hearts and homes. How do you, in the first place, approach them? What do you really know about these people? So those are some of the things that might be going on in your mind as you're preparing for, for this outreach. So we want to try and prepare you as much as we can. And then also through this video, we will be able to prepare overseas people who might find this uh, helpful. So let me pray for us and uh, we will look at evangelism. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity again to learn from you learn about your scriptures, to learn about the people that we are going to uh, speak to when we evangelize in Mozambique, and help us, Lord, to try to understand at least some of the things that might become barriers, and that we can be able to deal with those barriers while we're still preparing ourselves for this outreach. We ask for understanding, and we ask for hearts that are receptive of your word, in Jesus' name. So I'm not going to cover the personal testimony as we did last week. Uh, I'm just going to look at the evangelism, but perhaps maybe to recap, when I was asked to guide you on giving your testimony, I talked to you about three things, what uh, your life was like before salvation. And I said to you, whenever you're going to give a testimony like that, try and focus on your life in line with, especially the Ten Commandments. So that people can understand that we broke God's law. Our sin it breaks God's law. So you can be, if you can be able to look at that. And we talked about salvation, something that I'm going to cover in this training of evangelism. As we look at what points we need to focus on when we really relate our salvation to the people. What should they understand about salvation? And let me say this again: that things that we're going to talk about here. Uh, the people in Mozambique or anywhere you will go, you'll find that they are not blank slates. And by that I mean, if you're going to talk to them about God, they have an idea of God. They may not be having a, a, a biblical understanding of God, but they do have a theology of their own. They might have learned that from their culture, from their traditions, but they do know something about God. When you throw out the word salvation there, this happened yesterday as we were going around uh, TV and just preaching. I, I met one lady on, on the road and I just started working with her and I started talking to her about Christ. And she said, so you know him, you know Jesus Christ, you know. Do you know salvation? She says, yeah, no, I am saved. I know each, of, each one of us from their own churches understands salvation differently. I was baptized. So that's what uh, I, I got as I was, I was talking to this lady yesterday, and she was from the ZCC. Now, that's the theology. You know, it. baptism is emphasized in the ZCC. So you're going to find the same things in Mozambique. When you talk about salvation, they have an idea of salvation, but do they really have an understanding of biblical salvation? When you talk about sin, same thing. They have a theology of sin. Africa at large and even worldwide, you will see that uh, they, we do have the theology of sin. Mediator, it's a big thing we're going to look at as well. They have an idea of mediators. So we need to be able to think about those things. Second Corinthians chapter 10, I want to start right there in verse uh, 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul writes this, even as we think and uh, reflect on salvation, reflect on evangelism, reflect on the people that we're going to evangelize. The Apostle Paul says, 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war again according to the flesh. That's our battle. We're going into a spiritual warfare when we go into the mission field. It is a warfare. And as I've seen in your files, the very first lesson you need to study, it's about spiritual warfare. We're preparing ourselves to know that we are going out into the battle. The Apostle Paul goes on to say in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. There are many of those fortresses that need to be demolished. Verse 5, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So how then are we going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ as we go into Mozambique? I want you to think about the people you are going to minister to. That's crucial. Who are the people you are going to, to minister to? They don't think like you do. They may not have the same culture as yours. They don't have the same world view as yours. Every culture, every country, every place you go to has its own world view. And that world view is uh, really uh, uh, influenced by the, the way we were raised, isn't it? The way you think about things, that's because of the worldview you were raised with. There are a number of things that you see done and you may be thinking, that's not what we do in our culture. Or perhaps you may even think that biblically that's wrong, only to find that the influence really comes from your culture, not the Bible. So we need to be able to think about those things and say, when I'm going to address, I'm going to approach people and I see things done, is this a cultural thing or is this a, a religious issue? How does that worldview influence the way people are going to accept or to even interpret the word of God? So cultural and traditional beliefs are very important things for us as we are going to address these issues. So think about the culture in Mozambique. Some of you have already been there. Some of you have done evangelism last year. Some of you were there and you understood or you got to learn something of the traditions or the culture in Mozambique. Now here is a test for you and I've said this last week again, but let me test you about that old lady that I went to visit in Mozambique evangelizing and I found that she was busy boiling some roots for her child who was sick and my worldview right I'm now thinking about my how I was raised automatically rushes to that's muti right mm -hmm. she got some roots mm -hmm. the child has problem with the headaches and she is boiling this root she's going to give to and so I'm asking the, the grandma what is that what are you going to do with that oh she says no we grew up with this this is this kind of root and I'm boiling it once my grand my grandchild drinks this we will be okay so what do you do with that coming from South Africa or from a Western culture that really, yes, understand things about ancestral worship. You have ideas about muti and so on. Do you tell that grandmother, no, don't do that. That's demonic. Now, what are we dealing with there? Are we dealing with culture or are we dealing with religion? You can answer. How are you going to approach that person? You want to evangelize, but that thing is disturbing you. Is that religious or is that cultural? <laughs> okay, so are you, gonna stop, are you going to stop her from doing that? Stop digging mutis in the fields and give it to your children? You see, that's one thing that we're going to have to look at and say, rather instead 
of making conclusions, let me ask questions, right? Where do you get that? Who taught you that? Why do you believe that these things are going to be helpful to your child? Now you will be able to establish whether there is worship in this thing or whether this is just a normal way of saying as you would take Advil or Panado, that's the same way this person is going to take this root and give to the child because it's been working since. You see that? So you are now dealing with that. Okay, how is this thing uh, influencing this particular person? So that's just one example of culture. So you have to make that distinction of culture. But not only that, the worldview will be influenced by their social status. When you go to Mozambique, you will realize that it's not a developed country, especially the places that we go into. Charlie, that we go into, is not a developed village, is not a developed country. So their social status. Let me make mention of this. I don't think I mentioned this last week about their social status, but I was just reflecting on this. As I said, the moment you cross the border, you are going to be struck by compassion, which is good. You will have sympathy because you will see that South African border and Mozambican border, there is such a vast contrast between the two borders. You will notice immediately that I am in a totally different country. You just drive in the first village, you will start seeing children who are not well dressed. You will just see dilapidated homes and so on. You will be struck by sympathy because of the social, uh, uh, you know, living in, in, in Mozambique. So as you see that, this is what I want you to think. Yes, they are poor but they are not beggars. Do you get that? The people in Mozambique, yes, they are poor, but they are not beggars. If you can have that in your mind, it will help you to not think, oh man, maybe I should just take off my shirt and give it to them. By the time you get to the third village, you would have nothing, and you realize you cannot actually eliminate any of that problem. People in Mozambique, they are very poor, but you will notice that they are hard workers. They are not beggars. They get up early in the morning, they go to their field to work. I think their work ethic often is much better than the work ethic we see in civilized countries. Because they know they ought to work for their food. So, I'm going to ask you to try and think about it so that you can start thinking about the main reason you are there. The main reason you are there is not to try and alleviate poverty, but it is to point those people to Christ. All right? I'm not saying suppress sympathy, compassion and all that, but I'm saying just realize that you, are not, you cannot change that. And God has not chosen to change that. But what you can do is to say, I know that once I bring life, spiritual life, once I bring light to the people of Mozambique, eternity in heaven will be different from what you are seeing when you get into Mozambique. Now again on the social uh, status in Mozambique, I want to warn you. I will use again myself as, a, as an example with the illustrations that we use when we are in Mozambique. Naive as we are. I am Shangan, but raised in South Africa. And more so, Shangan raised in the Hammonskral area. You can see that we are far apart. Okay? My culture that I grew up in is different from the culture, the Shangan culture in Mozambique. So being Shangan, I stood up one day and I was preaching 1 Peter chapter 2. And as I was preaching there, you know, take off, put on, put off that passage and I thought, okay, what illustration can I use here, right? And by the way, maybe while thinking about that, don't be Mark Rayleigh. Okay. <laughs> Mark Rayleigh preached a similar passage and I was interpreting for him 
and Mark Reilly, he tore his shirt and he took it off. <laughs> he actually started by dating that white shirt, dating it, and all of a sudden he says, you have to take it off, and he took it off and he threw it away, and I said to him, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 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 okay, so I was preaching the similar passage in, uh, in one of the villages, and so this is the illustration I used. I said to them, how many of you would have the same set of clothes on his body for the whole week? That was not wise at all. Because they raised their hands and said, I can. And I looked at it and said, you are right. That's because they don't have you know what? Clothes to change to. So they would spend two, three weeks. If the kids, you would see, last year you have seen some of the kids with sim you may find that they're still wearing the similar clothes when you go back there and they are dirty and tattered. So that was a wrong illustration to you. So you're going to have to think through those illustrations when you talk to them. So don't use illustrations from a developed social status or country. I was t training leaders there as well. And one of the things that I was going to mention, actually I did, was issue of homosexuality. And they looked at me puzzled. You mean men marry men? You mean women get married to women? And I said to them, please just forget that I even mentioned that. Because that was not a problem. So when you go there and you go to evangelize, think about the problems that need to be addressed. And don't just carry with you. And that's one danger maybe about already prepared notes with illustrations. You need to be able to adapt to say what is going to be relevant. So maybe in the course of your preparation, start thinking about those things. Thirdly, while we're thinking about that, and it's still about influencing worldviews because Mozambique people have worldviews. Here's another thing. I said they are poor, but they are not beggars. Let's also clarify this one. People in Mozambique are, yes, illiterate. And if we mean by illiterate that they haven't gone to school, that is true. They, 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 they never had an opportunity to go to school. Some young ones who are coming up, if they, the parents are well up, they're able to send them to, them, to Mapai, to high school, but they are illiterate in there. But illiteracy does not mean unintelligent. Did you get that? People in Mozambique are, you will find them to be one of the intelligent group of people that you will meet. When you sit down to talk to them, they understand life. They live life. They understand life. They know how to make this. You can learn a lot from just spending time with them. May not be, you know, book literacy, but they have gone through life and they understand it. So when with that being said, you will notice that they are not bookish. By that we mean that they don't have a whole lot of written material. You know when I find people in Mozambique walking around with books and saying I'm busy reading. They are oral learners. So they hear and they speak. That's how information is passed in Mozambique. And that actually puts so much responsibility upon us who are going to teach them because whatever you say to them, it is going to become authority and they're going to pass it on to the next generation. So we're going to have to be careful that we say what we are sure of in the Bible because you can be sure the moment they hear it, it's going to be passed on to the next person. So they will believe it. So then, then we don't have less responsibility in our preparation as we go there. We have more to be so sure about what we say. Again, with that being said, people in Mozambique have a very short memory, uh, maybe not memory, but attention span. They can pay attention, but they are easily distracted. That's what I have found as I do evangelism there. You will go in, they will welcome you, and they will give you the best of whatever they have to sit on, accept that, 
sit on. If you have to sit on that, sit on that. That's what we do a number of times. And they will come and they will sit down and they will listen to you. Let's also maybe let me help you with this because we being gentlemen, we're going to Mozambique and the ladies come and they give us a chair and we say, no, 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 you sit on it. I'll say, no, no, take that chair. Culturally, it's unacceptable for a man to sit on the floor and for a woman to sit on a chair. So don't feel bad whenever they offer things like that. You actually become offensive if you don't take that from them. So allow them to treat you. They will treat you well in doing that. They will give you their best and use them. But here's what's going to happen. Yes, you're busy evangelizing. You're busy talking and talking and talking and you will have somebody, maybe one lady from the street and say, Hey, Shawane, that means hello, I'm Shani. <laughs> and they will turn and look at that person and they will start having a conversation. In your mind, in your civilized Western mind, you're like, hello, you can't be doing that. I'm busy talking to you. Why are you turn and talk to that person there? That's one thing you're going to have to learn while in Mozambique. Patience is one of the things God will teach you as you evangelize, is you wait. Okay? Your interpreters will also help you with that. They will tell you, just relax. <laughs> they will come back. They will give you the attention again. Once they are done, they will come back and they will look at you. Now you can continue. At times, actually, that can be valuable because you can actually invite that person to come and sit and they will do that respectful. We talked this about this last week and say Mozambican people are very respectful, they are very humble. They will give you attention. Very rarely will you have someone who will tell you, no, I don't want to listen. They will give you time. Even in their busy schedule, they will give you time to sit. What I usually do is as we go into these villages in a group, if I found that lady busy pounding their grain or what have you, I try to help. I will take that mortar and start pounding for them while someone is busy evangelizing. But I found that a number of times we do the wrong things and she will come, that lady will come and take it from you. When they do that, don't resist. Because basically they're telling you, you're actually going to give me more work. <laughs> by what you're doing. So let me do it. And so if you see that again, let go. And rather sit down, talk to her about the gospel, and when you're done, she will know what to do. So those are the things that I've picked up as we evangelize. So I want you to be thinking as you study how to evangelize scripturally, but also think about that background of those cultural issues because they can hamper your... Um, uh, your, 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 your evangelism as you do that. i glad that we're repeating this study because I think last week I did not deal with the issue of honor and shame. The view of honor and shame. I think every culture has that. We have those views of honor and shame in, in different countries. There are a number of things that you will see in Mozambique that they view them as honor and they view them as shame. One of those things are children. If you are in Mozambique, one of the things that the ladies will take, uh, they take pride in is how many children do you have? Ladies, you will have that. I've had one lady who uh, once came to me, missionary came to me and said, what do I do? Because they keep asking me about how many children I have and I don't have a child. They are, sometimes they are not diplomatic <laughs> in asking that question. It's like in their mind, they expect every woman to have a child or children. And if you don't have children in Mozambique, it's, it's, it's like a shame for a woman. It's a, and that's one of the things that you might find. The reason they, there's polygamy in Mozambique is because of that. When a man marries a wife and she doesn't give birth, with agreement with her wife, they will go and get another woman to come so she can reproduce. They can be children at home. They could be heirs. So we're going to confront cultures like that. 
So you're going to have that view of honor and shame, and you're going to already you see you're going to have to confront polygamy. What do you do when you meet a person, a man who's polygamous, has five, six, seven, and seven wives? And you start talking to them about the gospel. I was asked that question once in Mabuzani. One, uh, Mabuzani is a village next to Charlie. So we were evangelizing this man. I was interpreting for one missionary uh, from the state. And uh, he asked that question. He said, well, my problem is I have three wives. What should I do? And uh, I found that the missionary I was interpreting to was very naive. And he said, mm -hmm. you will have to divorce the other ones and the man with the first one. One thing that you will learn quickly from our interpreters is that they're not going to say everything you say. <laughs> we train them well. They are very discerning to say, okay, this dude can't hear anything that I say, so I'm not going to tell this person what he said, and I'm going to tell him what I know I should be saying. So I was the interpreter then, and so this guy says, yeah, you have to divorce that. And I said to this guy, you have responsibility to those women. <laughs> <laughs> he got gone to camp. And so he's giving a report. We have the we, we do debriefings, right? In the evenings. So <laughs> he raised it and said, Yeah, we met this guy. Remember, William said, So what did you tell him? And he's like, Well, no, I told him he's going supposed to divorce. William said, Yeah. I said to him, William, I was there. Right? That settles it. <laughs> I was there. You can be sure that guy did not hear what this guy was advising. <laughs> So you're going to come across that if you're married to three or four women, you are still responsible to them. Okay? Does that hinder him from coming to salvation? No. no. Share the gospel with him. Share the gospel with those four wives. We would often tell them the only hindrance is that you cannot become a leader in the church because the Bible says an elder should be a one-woman man. Right? But you still have to carry on with your wife. So we're not going there to encourage divorce. What happens to those two, three women after you have encouraged divorce? If this guy is what he was looking for, those two, three women are going to hate Christ and his church. Don't you think? The children of those women are going to hate Christ and his church. So you don't have to be careful of the advice you give. So you don't have to switch your mind and say, I need to understand the culture here and the difficulties that comes with honor and shame and you need to be able to address those things. So there is more that we can talk about in, in view of honor and shame, but you can also capitalize on that. Why do you have a sense of honor and shame? And you can bring them to the Bible, right? You're going to, one thing you're going to do as was well you're going to have to be, um, what's the right word? Spontaneous, is that the right word? Or quick thinking? In other words, there will be situations you're presented with that you're like, I know that I never prepared for that. It's not something that I can say I have. So question and answers are going to bring things in, in your approach as well. How do you approach people? as you, you go there, and that's what I want to go there now, as we deal with, so that was, you can package that as worldview, but worldview, as I said, it's theology as well. So what's the theology in Mozambique? Now, I want you to take the theology of the people you are reaching out to seriously while you're seeking to be true to the teaching of Scripture. You're going to preach to them in their own context. That's, that's what we call cr crossing culture, right? You're going to be true to scripture, but also understanding your learners, understanding the people that you are talking to. Here's an example, ex here's an example that I can give you with the lady I met last year who came into the village training to be a Sangoma. I, I, forget, I, I keep forgetting that village we went to last year. Yeah, that's right. Well, then that was the, the first time we went into that village was new with the fourth year students. See, 
Si ogo, si ogo, ni now I want, I want to pronounce it like you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. So si ogo ni, or si ogo ni. Okay. So that's the place uh, we went to. So as we were doing evangelism, go went into the fields, and so I met with uh, students this lady who was who came into that village of Siogoni to train as a Sangoma. And so it was going to be a tough one and even a fun one for students. What we do? Your students are so good. So you are our lecturer. You start the conversation. So I did that. Spoke to this lady. So I started asking her questions. Okay, who are you? Why are you here? I could tell she was training as a Sangoma because of how she was dressed. You can tell from those those things. Uh, whatever uh, skin she has around her wrist and the uh, wrap, wraps that she has around and so on. So I started talking to her and this is what she said. And this is theology for you. I am here because my brother sent me to come and train as a Sangoma, a witch doctor. Now, doing this, I do this because my children have died, my parents have died, my siblings have died. There have been so many deaths in my family. And the ancestors says that this is the route I need to take in order to stop those deaths. So my brother paid money and he sent me into this village to be trained. So you confronted with that. And this is what this woman believed, right? And so as we were talking, you start picking the theology there. Now let me ask you what are a number of things already that you're picking up from that, from that response, which are theological and you're going to have to address. Can you think of anything from her response? Children have been dying, family members dying, brother sent me here so that I can train here as a Sangoma. In other words, the only way those things are going to stop is if I can go through this training as a witch doctor. Or, okay, so yeah, witch doctor I think is the better word. Uh, what is the word that you, the Americans will understand? Witch, witch doctor, doctor. okay? So Sangoma, witch doctor, <coughs> you will hear that word a lot. So just to help you with that, whenever you hear Sangoma, you know that you're referring to witch doctors. So you go through that training. So what is the theology you're picking up from the response this woman is giving? A view of death. Okay? That's one thing. There's also a view of salvation in that. I'm here to act as a savior. To stop what is going on back home. What else do you have? Did you pick anything? Yes, you have. Okay, there is a curse. Okay, so that's a good one. You see how we're picking that now? Does, did the Bible address those things? Death? Okay, Savior? Curse? That's exactly those things. So by asking those questions, and you're not rushing to say, you know, do you know Jesus? You know he saves and so on. No, you say, let me take time to listen to this person so I can hear their theology. That's a worldview. So I can know how to respond to them biblically. What does the Bible say about cares? What does the Bible say about death? What does the Bible say about Savior and so on? And you're also going to have to deal with, is this the right way of dealing with those things? You being a witch doctor, what does that mean? Because that's worship. So you're going to address worship. Okay? And so she says that. And so I start addressing that. But that was not all the problem. Because the moment we started talking, addressing those issues and talking about Christ, she began to bring now more problems. And she said, if I quit, this training right now is going to be costly for me. I need to pay. That person is going to demand from me so many cattle that I don't have. My brother is going to be mad with me and is going to disown me for not finishing this training. So what is, what is this woman faced with now? Rejection. Rejection. Do you see that view of honor and shame? Mm -hmm. And fear as well. I am going to be 
rejected. So those are not small matters and I don't want you to uh, minimize such things whenever going to do with that. But again, that's, a, that's going to be, so you see that the cost of discipleship is going to come in. The moment this woman puts her trust in Christ, it's going to cost her. Now with that being said, you go back to saying, and you know, whenever I talk to people like that, I need to see and I ask the people work, man, that's what you're going to have to do. When someone is presenting the gospel, when you are there, don't be distracted by looking at that. Remember, you are in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Pray for that person's heart. Pray that as now we start wielding the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God will penetrate because the gospel has power. Remember that we want to take down those fortresses, those speculations to bring every thought captive. This is what I usually would do just to stimulate the conversation now from uh, the Bible. I read this passage to that lady. I said, let's start dealing with some of the things in your life. Okay, you th you're saying that your parents who are there spoke to you and they're the ones who sent you here. That this is what I read from the Bible. And I read Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 to her. I said, here it is. It says, for the living know they will die. Is that not true? Yes. That the living know they will die. But the dead do not know anything. That's the Bible. Dead people know nothing. So you say, hey, what do you think about that? The Bible says that people know nothing, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Verse 6 says, indeed their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Okay, so you said your grandparents talked to you about that, as, or your parents who are dead, the Bible says they do not communicate to you, but that leaves you with another portion. Then who are the voices that spoke to me? You see, what you're doing is you're not saying to this lady, no, you never had those things. Mm -hmm. That's not your experience. It's her experience, right? Mm -hmm. It would be wrong for you to say, no, 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 you never had a voice like that telling you this. You'll tell you, I had that voice over and over again. Question we, we, what we need to do now is address that and say, what, whose voice is that? Because the Bible tells us it cannot be of the dead people. Then that voice is coming from somewhere. Now what theology do we need to introduce there? Satan. Mm -hmm. Demons. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And so we are able to help us see no one really wants to worship Satan. And the moment you get to that point and say, what you had, it's really satanic, it's for coming from Satan. He's the one who sent you to come and do this. Now you're beginning to establish a way of saying, I will help you with the freedom from Satan. Because Christ came to free you from there. So that's just one example of that uh, lady there. So try to unearth the wealth you try to unearth the theology because that's what you are going to address. So don't rush to say, let me tell you the gospel because they have no idea why they need it. But once you have built this, you're able to say, you really need the Savior. You need the freedom that comes from Christ. So, what then do you do from there? Let me rush to say that uh, find out again a better approach because that's where we fail okay we are armed with scripture aren't we mm -hmm. we are baptist christ baptist church we, we ignore the bible we have read it but sometimes our approach could be what's wrong in our conversation there i i've done some study in the bible to just to see how the New Testament uh, preachers, and including Christ, John the Baptist, 
their apostles, how they approached people, different people. You would notice in Jesus' ministry that he, it wasn't one love fits all type of an approach, but he approached each person based on their level. Think of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 10, and what is the question he asks Jesus? What can I do, right, mm -hmm. to inherit eternal life? Mm -hmm. What is the question? What can I mm -hmm. do? Okay, and Jesus looks at this guy and what is the answer? What does the law say? You want to do? Let's see if you can do. What does the law say? Mentions it, and he says, I'm okay with that. I have kept that from childhood. Mm. One thing that Jesus doesn't do with him is to argue with him and say, no way. Although we know that guy already there, he broke one law, he lied. Right? Because mm. there's no one who can keep the law. If you break one, you broke them all. But Jesus looks back at him again. He actually started by saying, why do you call me good? Because he addressed him as good teacher. Why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. Now we can think of that as well and say, was Jesus not good? Doesn't it say he's a good shepherd? Isn't he a good teacher indeed? Yes, he was. But Jesus is answering this guy because he understands the portion that comes. You're calling me good according to your own standard. And the moment I accept the standard of your good, you're going to think that you and I are in the same level. Mm -hmm. Because you think you're good, you've been keeping the law. So Jesus now addresses the heart. He is rich, and he says to him, one thing you lack, go and sell, and give to the poor, and come and follow me. The Bible says you are away grieving. He was saddened by that statement. Oh yeah, I kept the law, but I'm not really going to take care of the poor. I'm not really going to give up my possession just to follow you. No. And so that's the that's one approach we should look at and so use. Peter, the apostles, I mean, I'll let, or maybe let me rush you to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul moved from one city to the other. In Acts chapter 16, we know that when he's there, he's preaching to the jailer, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that a Philippian jailer? That Philippian jailer saw what has just happened. You know, the, the, the prison opened. Paul is still there in Silas. They were singing songs at night. And so the only question that comes from his mouth is, what man, what can I do to be saved? What is their answer? Believe. But that's not always what you see. He goes next into the synagogue in Thessalonica in chapter 17. What does Paul do in the synagogue? He takes them to the Old Testament, he raises from the scriptures. He moves, he goes to Corinth, uh, maybe before Corinth, actually still in 17. He is in Athens. What does he do when he, he saw all the gods? He uses that as an approach. I can see that you guys are religious. Mm -hmm. Right? And you know what? As I was looking around, there is even an altar written on it to the unknown God. Mm -hmm. And Paul takes that altar and says, let me use that to tell you about the unknown God. That does not mean that altar there was really reserved for the true God. It was mainly saying, if there is another God that we have forgotten to give name to, mm -hmm. this altar will represent that God. And Paul said, let me tell you about him who is in heaven. So look for those things in your approach. You listen, you ask good questions, and you say, this is how I can approach this person and be able to bring uh, the message of salvation to them. Okay? So lastly, let's close up with this. Then, what do they believe? These people, you go going to evangelize people specifically in Mozambique, what do they believe about God? That's the first question. Find out that. Who is God is not, an, is not a wrong question to ask because that's where we need to start. What do they know about God?
most people would know God as the creator. That's what you'll find out. They know, imutumboloshi, you will hear that word a lot. Creator. Imutumboloshi was your language. Whenever I hear people say that he is the creator of all things, I bring the question back and say, is he your creator? You want to make it personal, right? It's okay. He is indeed a creator, but is he your creator? Do you acknowledge that? And yeah, they will acknowledge that. If then he is your creator, what do you think he requires of you? Because it is personal. So God is the creator and God as the holy God. Those We can just get to understand those two uh, characteristics or attributes of God. It will be helpful in our evangelism. Because as God is a creator, he owns all his creation. As the holy God, we stand condemned and judged before him. Because we cannot approach his holiness. You see that? So we're going to use that. And what, what is their view of man? Man. Now, when you think about man, your mind might be, maybe rest into different things that the people in Mozambique might be going to. But in a nutshell, when you're going to think about man in Mozambique, think about the origin of man, think about death. Death is a, rea it's a, it's a reality in Mozambique. Here in South Africa, we have ways of trying to keep us alive prolonged because we have good medical system, right? We can get medication and so on. People die. There have been a number of times I went to Mozambique and I, I had to do the burials of young people from malaria and all that. So death confronts them most of the times. Once a day I was driving out of Mozambique and I stopped in the village of Chukumba and uh, I went into the bush, I found a dead person, a dead body in that bush. I went and reported to the village, to one, the, the, the house close by, and they said to me, yeah, we know. A person is dead, is dead, yeah, we know. There is something here. What is their view of death? Why are they not dealing with that body? Who's going to take care? There was some stranger coming into, 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 into their village. So they don't know this person, but that person died. And what are they going to do? Who's going to bury this person? There's no mortuary. There's no looking for their family members and so on. But what is their view of death? So it's a reality you're going to deal with. Afterlife as well. What do they believe about afterlife? When a man dies, what happens? You have see, heard about that Sangoma lady. Man dies, you become an ancestor. You have to address those issues for them to understand uh, the doctrine of man. Doctrine of sin. I think universally people understand sin is breaking the law. And so that's what we're going to use as we preach or evangelize. Mediator. What do they view as a mediator in Mozambique? Now another influence in Mozambique you would see it's not just ancestral worship but it is also the ZCC. We have the ZCC in South Africa. It is big in Mozambique. They have prof I dealt with prophetess from the ZCC last year in, in Mozambique. And whenever you start again the approach there, whenever you get to understand the religion of the person, it changes your approach. We have an advantage in South Africa because we know what the ZCC teach. They, in most cases, they don't even know in Mozambique what the ZCC is and what they teach. They think that this is a biblical church. It is not. You have to have to address those kinds of uh, teachings to them. So mediator, is it people? Is it ancestors? So before you even talk about Christ, you need to be able to break down what they have as the mediators. Because the moment you just bring in Christ, it's an addition to the other media, media, media is that they have. The God between our ancestors work hand in hand with your God. So that means I can add to my Jesus so that I can have 
maybe, you know, a strong conduit to God. That's what they believe. They have gone to have to preach Christ as the only mediator. So don't be quick to say believe in Christ because they may not reject it. Because they think, if I can add this Western God to my African God, I may be well protected. So uh, deal with those things there. And now you can talk about salvation. And when you address salvation, address what it is and what it is not. And also address what we are saved from. Because we could be thinking about so many things and not and, and fail to go to the original sin and to the wrath of God. Salvation, brothers and sisters, it is saved from God Himself, from His wrath. God paid the price for God. We understand that. And that's what we need to bring to the people. Now, with all that being said, it's like I've put a cut in front of the horses because here is the question. After you have said all those things, what do these people know about your Bible? What do they know about the Bible? You've been quoting and quoting and quoting from the Bible. What do they know about it? Some of them have never touched it. Some might have heard of it but never heard from it. Most of them may not know how to read it because they cannot read. So you need to be able to talk to them about the Bible and why they should believe it. That's the authority, isn't it? Did you notice that they have their own authority in their culture and in their traditions? And you come with the authority of the written word? You may want to help them to say, by the way, God, this God we're talking about has spoken to us. And this is his word. This is how he has spoken. If anything comes to you and it is not coming from this word, we can be sure that God has not spoken. And so you want to help them have faith in the truth in the Bible. So I think those are a number of things that I could bring to you. I want to, for us here, I think I made this recommendation. I want to recommend that you go and check Pastor Charlie's sermons on our CBC website. And in the, the ones that he did for the book of Acts on evangelistic preaching. And that is going to fill more of your, the content of our message. And I know that in your files also you have the evangelism, uh, what, what is that? Just to guide you on in terms of the Bible. We did not cover that when it comes to scriptures and so on. We want to go there well armed with the Bible. I was just helping you with saying, understand the people you're going to minister to. But that file there should help you more with the content of the Bible. So how to take that content of the Bible within that culture in Mozambique. Do you, is there any question? I know our time is up. Yes, sir? Yeah, you raised the issue of uh, polygamy. Mm, polygamy, yeah. So, in your answer or your response, you know, you could put it to support to take care of those women. Yeah. So, but can we go ahead and say now, you are not supposed to add on those three that you put off on that one. Oh, yes, yes. I think that's what, that's what we should be able to mm. say and say, you know, if you're going to, you realize that you, the Lord does not allow polygamy, right? And this is one thing in your life that you're not going to reverse unless they die. Don't kill them. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Don't add. When we come back next year, if we're able to come back, you don't want to find that you have five. Right? So take care of those three. And I know some questions come to us. I actually thought that's the question you're going to ask. Say, okay, is the responsibility that he has only to them? to take care of their children and to support them, to make sure that they eat and all that. How about the sexual responsibility? He has that to 
all of them. All right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be a difficult one. But remember that the gospel has power mm-hmm. over anything else. And, and that's one thing about the gospel, the fact that we are not saved by works, is that God can save a polygamous man and that man can continue in that polygamy but still be saved before God. I know that we may have different views. Even here in South Africa, we may have different views in saying we need to encourage that. And here is the word, listen to the tale. He has to divorce the other so that he can remain with one. You cannot just say separate, it's divorce. Because it's married to one. So it's like replacing one sin with the other. So for me, I would say I don't want to be the hindrance to the gospel, especially even with those wives. So you have responsibility to go in prayers that you can all come to the Lord. Because it is by grace, not by works. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, there's a regular problem that always exists in Mozambique. And usually it deals with a wife who has come to know Christ. But the husband mm. may be a pastor from the Zionist church and now forbids her <coughs> to go to church yeah. and so how would you approach uh, ministering to her yeah. in those circumstances can, can I uh, similar just a little bit we met a I think it was a chief bishop mm. and then the <coughs> wife committed to Christ mm-hmm. last year mm-hmm. and then the gentleman was proud of the wife been regular and been born again but when we asked them and until eventually we said, would you mind to come to the service tonight? We didn't see you. We said, I'll do my utmost best. Mm-hmm. But he never came. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that he was proud and happy of the wife uh, mm-hmm. being in church and being born again, but mm-hmm. couldn't. Yeah. So um, in response to those questions there, it's going to be, yeah, so the wife is safe, the husband is not the husband is the leader of that particular cult, you can call it, or this unbelieving church. I think maybe it can be approached in two ways. One is going to be, and I'm going to bring what the Bible is about when we become the disciples of Christ, but also <clears throat> noticing that honor shame that came, because that's going to be a stigma in the community in saying, You know, the husband, wife, there is great submission in Mozambique. Wives, you will see, they submit to their husbands in in Mozambique. They understand submission in men. Sometimes when you look at it, they say, some relationships are better abusive in the way that the women that submit. I wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't do that to my wife. But you will see, and some of them may be cultural issues like with the women kneeling before the man. Those things don't bother me culturally if the woman doesn't feel that she is pressed to do it but she's doing it willingly because this is how I can show respect to my husband. They are there. You will see those things. But now that obedience also that submission might filter into I believe in Christ and this is what Christ requires of me and this is what my husband requires of me now, um, where, what, what, how do I satisfy both? And that's why now we bring in the Bible and say, the Bible pro- tells us such things are going to happen. Whoever loves his wife, his children, his family, more than I, is not fit. Right? For me and to be in my kingdom. So there is going to be there. By that does not mean divorce your husband. What we mean is that you're going to have to go through this. It may be a suffering that the Lord has placed for you. You're still going to continue with your husband and love your husband. But we want to try and help you with the truth that you know. Because you cannot continue ancestral worship in the ZCC and still call yourself a believer. 
And so it's going to help people to see the cost of discipleship. And with that, remember that it is God who is at work, not us. The gospel is at work. Each one of us here, I think, might have had to deal with that. For me, it had to be with my parents. I had to say, I respect and I love my parents, but Christ has saved me and I can no longer continue in that lifestyle that my parents want me to continue in because this is a family thing. So somewhere along the way, we had to address that. And you're going to address that you mustn't do. So that's where again the issue of saying, I don't want to cause troubles for me to go away. You need to be able to say, it is God's word, I'm going to give it to you. And I pray that the Lord who saved you will take you through this as I disciple you. On how to, to love your husband, on how to handle your unbelieving husband, but at the same time being faithful to Christ. Honor Christ more than you go into honor human relationships. It starts there. So that, that would be my response to that. Don't shy away from the truth of the Bible. I think uh, from the two questions which were raised, mm. uh, just supporting what you have just said, uh, Pastor David. Mm. Paul himself wrote to the Corinth, and that's where you get the, the, the supporting answer to what you have just said. Mm -hmm. uh, first Corinthians <coughs> chapter 7, seven. Yeah, mm -hmm. from 12 to 14. And he stipulated a number of uh, situations where the husband is a believer in Christ mm -hmm. and the wife is not. Mm -hmm. And the same applies to a wife being a believer and the husband is not. Mm -hmm. All what he's saying is that it will be better not to divorce or to yeah, separate. Sure. Yeah. Therefore, it means the more you, the, your faith as a person within that kind of environment increases mm -hmm. and gets stronger, the more yeah. the other one is getting sanctified, mm -hmm. both yeah. by actions and by... And talking about that, yeah. you'll notice again the difficulty, especially in Mozambique, you know, mm -hmm. and this is where the, the mindset is different, is that the Mozambican women are not going to be thinking divorce, they're going to be thinking, I am scared. Yes. Mm -hmm. This might happen. Whereas, you know, in other cultures, it could be, ah, if divorce comes, let it come. But in there, the, the difficult is going to be, but if I continue like this, my husband might send me back home. That's the language they will use. My husband might send me back home. Now, you, you understand that it's costly. That's where the cost comes in and say, am I going to continue with my faith in Christ? How can I compromise and do as my husband want me to do so that I don't get sent home? Uh, so we're not going to minimize that. We're just going to have to tell yes. the truth yes. and, love and look to the Lord. for, And that's what we have to help the, the, them to understand. So you're going to trust God through this. It's going to be a trial. First Peter chapter 3 talks to them and say, if your husband is an unbeliever, you may not win that husband by words, you're going to win that husband by your deeds. Yes. Okay? And deeds does not mean disobey God, but no. it means let your wife, mm -hmm. let your husband see that actually there is such a huge difference from what you were before when you did all that I wanted you to do and to now that you love God, your submission to me is totally different. The way you speak to me even though, so let because God changes us, that transformation needs to be so evident that the husband who cannot be won by the word can be won by the way that we handle ourselves. As in. So we, we want to try and disciple them into that. I guess that's one thing that we're trying to do. Discipleship is going to come like that as we address issues like that. And as you sit down on the, in those women ministries, men ministries and so on, that's where you're going to, you may also want to try and say, let's address some of those issues there. Because they're going to come. And they're thinking, you guys are here for 10 days and you will be gone. And you're going to have to deal with yes. this. So help them to be solid in the Lord. Okay. The question I have is got to do with the potential to protect us from effective evangelizing. Mm -hmm. um, 
some women we came across commonly were saying, uh, my husband has been away. Mm. Went to South, South Africa, John. John, mm. exactly. And uh, since they've been there, I've never heard anything from him. Yeah. And uh, some brothers and sisters followed. I'm just thinking mm. the worst scenario. Mm. And then we're in a problem where Some members of the church in Chalita, which is unit from Mokisan, where we are the backing of the church, mm -hmm. helping us to reach out. And what we did, we, we invited those who were part of us in evangelism throughout, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. We left meals with them. And then uh, I got one of the, the general guys who were watching to say, these members who are here, able to accommodate because we are members here, am I invited to? <laughs> and then now we are faced with a challenge to say we have so much limited resources mm -hmm. and how do we still become effective yeah. in evangelizing those guys? So those practical issues are going to have to really yeah, deal with the jealousy, envy, resources, they will be jealous. And so, yeah, and in my, and I, I don't know how things work in our mom, but I know that when we uh, used to go in, in um, we would, mm -hmm. uh, we would invite the pastor, like Pastor Highwood and his wife, that's what we did. They understand that this is the past and so on. So the people in the community tend to understand that, but the moment you just invite an average person for the lack of a good word, like them, come there. You see, with a highway, with a pastor, they will say, oh, no, that's Mfundisi, we know. Mm -hmm. they, that's what they do. They would actually stand for the Mfundisi to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. But how did Joseph get invited to come and eat with, you know, people from Jordi and so on? So to, in order to avoid that, I know that we have tried to say, let's rather not create that situation there or that expectation there. So, you know, we're also helping to, trying to help the people in Mozambique, the church members, to say, it is your responsibility to go out in evangelism. You're not going to get paid for it. We're helping you. We want you to come. We want to come alongside you. I think that's the language you use. They are not coming alongside us. We're coming alongside them. So we are helping them, training them, and saying this is what you should be doing even when we are not around here. And they will appreciate that. So I think maybe to avoid creating that spirit of jealousy, rather not invite people into that camp. It is difficult. Your sympathy is going to be, let's do this, but like you said, it's a community day. You've noticed that in Mozambique, it's a community. Mm -hmm. It's not like Mkulupuan where everyone minds his own business, right? <laughs> everyone is like, they know each other, it's a community, and they will know it. Mm -hmm. The whole village will know about it, and they will talk about it. So if, if, if you can avoid so that the gospel is not hit that First Corinthians chapter 9, then rather uh, not do uh, things like that out in the bush. Okay. Our time, I think, more questions you can be asking but I want to respect you we have an evening service so let's